Long ago, before this day's confusion did begin Throughout the stars did we go wandering Distance was no barrier And time it had no hope Free to come and free to go Free to come and free to go Open up the book Hello, everyone, and welcome to Karmic Evolutions, Astrologically Speaking. I'm your host, Sherry Horn Hassan of Karmic Evolution Astrology, and I'm coming to you on February 2nd, 2024 from karmicevolution.com or any of your favorite podcast stations. So before we get into this week's astro news you can use, my usual quick reminder is that this show aims to bring you the truth about astrology and your soul's karmic evolution. And that a new show to remind you that a new show drops every Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific and 2 p.m. Eastern on most major podcast pla- uh, platforms. However, as I've said before, if you listen to this podcast at karmicevolution.com, You'll see a downloadable freebie labeled How to Keep Your Sun Sign Happy, which is friendly advice for every sun sign from renowned evolutionary astrologer Stephen Forrest, my mentor, about what each of us, depending on our specific sun sign, actually needs to be happy. So be sure to grab it when you listen to this podcast, whether you do so live or after the fact, and enjoy some astrological words of wisdom. In addition, if you'd like to learn more about the true meaning of your individual birth chart in order to gain greater consciousness about your soul's true mission and in purpose in this lifetime and what may be holding you back from achieving your highest destiny now, I offer a 75-minute Karmic Evolution Natal Insight discounted reading for only $125. And that is a discounted rate for podcast listeners only. So if you're feeling stuck, frustrated, or otherwise stymied in your relationships, your career, your, with your health, or other areas of concern, and you want to learn why, this reading is for you. If you'd like to understand how, by letting your unconscious script, which is based on old soul-conditioned behaviors from the past, run the show... And now you want to become more conscious about how to change this script up going forward, then again, this reading is for you. And if you'd like to co create your own future happiness through astrological insight, then this reading is definitely for you. So bear in mind it's important to look at your birth chart as your soul's map for your life's journey. In that sense, this reading is not about what's going to happen in the future, but rather a look back at the past to help you understand how and why you arrived at where you are today and what changes might be necessary in terms of your beliefs or perspectives about your life in order to find greater happiness in whatever areas of life are most problematic for you now. It's only when you understand this basic soul map that you can proceed to better understand and acknowledge what path the universe, or acknowledge and accept, I should say, what path the universe is calling you to follow through the transits and progressions that are hitting your chart now. And you, you know, whether or not these transits and progressions involve making or adjusting to major changes in your life, that serve your highest soul purpose. So again, so conscious awareness has never been so easy or so affordable when you take advantage of this special discounted Karmic Evolution Natal Insight offer, which you can easily find at karmicevolution.com slash karmic125. 
And if you'd like a further explanation of what the reading entails, feel free to visit karmicevolution.com slash astrological reading. Okay, so now let's get to this week's astro news you can use. But first, a little review. In recent podcasts, I've outlined how the Saturn-Pluto conjunction, which occurred at 22 degrees and 45 minutes of Capricorn on January 12th of 2020, that's a little more than four years ago now, triggered the beginning of what many call the New World Order, just as happened during the last cycle when Saturn last met Pluto, which was in Libra, in late 1982 and early 1983, and as a result of the beginning of the cycle in 1947, when a new world, world order was formed out of the ashes of World War II. Okay, so that's the backdrop I want to start with right now, and which I did talk about at length in last week's podcast. But now I want to flip forward to uh, the fact that we began this month's lunar cycle with the January 11th Capricorn new moon, which was square to the lunar south node in Libra and the lunar north node in Aries, which called us to apply a steady hand to get the ship safely to shore via planting seeds that would result in laying a new foundation for agreements in partnerships. And on January 17th, when we experienced the first quarter waxing square of the monthly lunar cycle, which happened when the Aries moon squared the Capricorn sun that day, this challenged us to push through toward bipartisan agreement, such as the kind necessary here in the U.S. House of Representatives relating to funding its, uh, you know, the government's budget for 2024. And of course, at that time, the holdout group was the GOP House faction of the right-wing right wing Freedom Caucus. So according to the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, and I quote here, on Thursday, January 18th, the House and Senate both passed a third continuing resolution for fiscal year 2024 to avoid a partial government shutdown at midnight on Friday, January 19th. The president signed the continuing resolution on January 19. The new measure would extend the laddered approach from the previous CR, which is continuing resolution, with the first set of appropriations bills expiring on Friday, March 1st in, for agriculture, energy, water, military construction, VA, and transportation, HUD. These were previously set, if you recall, to expire on January 19th. And the second set of appropriations bills will expire a week later on Friday, March 8th. And those will include commerce, justice, science, defense, financial services, general government, homeland security, interior environment, labor, HHS, education, legislative branch, and state foreign operations bills which were previously set to expire on February 2nd. The CR also extended several expiring policy deadlines until March 8th, end quote. Now, these CRs illustrate the successful navigation of this first quarter lunar monthly square through the cooperation of bi via bipartisanship rather than allowing the few uh, to work against the many and to stop progress. Okay, that's, of course, just an example, right? So to follow through with the same theme, then on January 25th at the Leo full moon, which squared Jupiter in Taurus, and which advised us to remember not to just go along to get along like sheeple with the ideological beliefs of any particular group, but rather to recognize who are our true trusted leaders. And as I noted last week, and I'm quoting now from what I said, however, one message of the Leo full moon seems clear at this point. That is that a leader had to break away from the pack in order for others to follow him or her. This is what Donald Trump has done in both Iowa and New Hampshire in terms of reflecting the energies of this lunation. It doesn't say that he's going to win the general election on November 5th, 
Rather, it indicates that for now he's leading the pack. So the whole full moon was an illustration of showing us on a on the you know universal screen. And I say that in part because although of course I'm focusing on United States domestic issues, I had spoken last week about how many different countries and the week before I believe are going to the polls to um decide whether you know who's going to be in charge who's going to be their leaders and a good number of them are existing democracies so as the united states faces the decline or the potential decline of democracy should donald trump be voted into office again in late 2024 this is a big issue so what happens here resonates throughout the rest of the world and that jibes with another thing i'll mention again which is the, uh, you know, and I'd already said, which is the new world order, right? Where is the United States in the pecking order of that new world order? So what is that new world order as it's in its nascent stages? And what is it likely to be? A lot of that is going to hinge on whether Donald Trump is elected the next president of the United States. But when the Leo full moon square Jupiter and Taurus, as I mentioned, it cautioned us not to project too much glory onto a seeming winner who may very well be and like, and is from all <laughs> from all observations overly optim optimistic and overly hubristic or arrogant about becoming our future leader, and in this case, again. And on January 22nd, the night before the January 23rd New Hampshire GOP primary and the day that Venus entered more serious Capricorn, Ron DeSantis presumably took a cold, hard look at how many voters were going to support his candidacy there and made the serious calculated decision to drop out of the race. And as we already know, Donald Trump went on to win the GOP nomination in that state, meaning New Hampshire, by 54.3% to Nikki Haley's 43.2% of the vote. So between then and now, as we approach today's third quarter Scorpio moon, which squares the Aquarius sun, we've seen the arrogance of the Republican National Convention via its push to declare Trump the de facto Republican presidential nominee, even though only two states have held prime have held their primaries thus far. So um, I'm assuming you're getting at you see what I'm getting at. And last week I delved into Nikki Haley's chart and mentioned the square of last October 28th lunar eclipse to her nodal Leo South Node in Leo North Node in Aquarius axis. But I neglected to mention that she's an Aries Sun, and since we have no birth time, we don't know what house her Sun is in. But we do know that if she was born between 936 and 1159 p.m., meaning 936 p.m. and 1159 and 59 seconds p.m. on the day January 20th of her birth, she also has, in addition to her Aries sun, an Aries moon. But if born between 12.01 a.m. on that day up until 9.36 p.m., she's a Pisces moon. That struck me as a little bit odd because she doesn't seem very much, she doesn't seem very Piscean. However, from the looks of it, and because you can clearly see she's extremely Aryan in her presentation out in the world, she does also have, which is something I noted, Mars and Aries, which is a very powerful martial Mars, squared by her Mercury in Capricorn. Now that kind of cardinal square is a very frustrating combination of energies, which I believe is evident through her speech during this whole campaign process. However, my point is to highlight that the martial energies in her chart, Aries Sun, Mars and Aries, Mercury square Aries, um, you know, which can make one argumentative, that this is what gives her the chutzpah to declare that she's not dropping out of the race, despite her two losses thus far, and notwithstanding also the push by the RNC to get her out, which is not um, unlike 
what happened in 2020 with the Democratic National um, Committee uh, in kind of edging Bernie Sanders out of the running, right? So we have a precedent for this. But she continues now to be the only one with enough balls to publicly point out Trump's cognitive decline. You know, so much has been made in the media about how Ron DeSantis and uh, Tim Scott and, um, you know, Asa Hutchinson and uh, Chris, uh, Chris Christie being the only exception. Nobody really pointed out Trump's flaws, right, which made it difficult for future voters or voters in the upcoming primaries to actually make any distinction between Trump and his rivals. And it's like, why do Trump light when you can have the real thing? So essentially, Haley, in pointing out Trump's arrogance and thinking he can win an election based only on his inflated sense of optimism and pride, you know, she sent notice to the uh, Republican National Convention to stop deciding the race before it's even barely begun to be run. So the other thing, you know, that we're in the nascent stages of is that is the Uranus Station Direct in Taurus, which followed almost immediately the Leo full moon uh, late on January 26th and early on the 27th. And what happened then? Well, I did the show that ran on January 26th, I believe it was, right? Um, let me find my calendar. Oh, yeah, a week ago was January 26th. Um, oh, I'm looking in the wrong calendar. Hmm. I'm always preparedly unprepared. <laughs> Yes, it was January 26th. All right. So that evening, after this podcast had already been recorded and aired, um, and in line with the message of the Leo Fu Moon, that a leader had separated from the pack, vis visibly separated, clearly in the form of Donald Trump when related to the microcosm of these presidential GOP primaries, we received late in the day... On January 26th, the verdict in the E. Jean Carroll trial that awarded her $83 million as a result of Trump's defamation of her. So when we add the $5 million award from his, her first trial against him that found him guilty of sexual assault, he now owes Carroll a total sum of $88 million. Now, this is not news to anyone who follows the news, I'm sure. But what's interesting is, you know, that so far, this last trial, whose verdict came suddenly, right, the jury only deliberated, I believe, for less than four hours. Um, so that trial accomplished what it set out to do, as Trump has since remained quiet, refraining from defaming Carol once again. But, you know, only time will tell if that actually lasts. You can imagine how thrilled I was when Lisa Rubin, one of the legal correspondents for MSNBC, announced on air that the time of Trump's first tweet maliciously defaming E. Jean Carroll took place on June 20th, 2019 at 5.17 p.m. So, of course, I ran Trump's chart for that date and time, and this is what I found. Beginning April 26, 2018, roughly a year before, a year and two months before, um, Mars conjoined Pluto at 21 degrees, 19 minutes of Capricorn in Trump's fifth house. At that time, this began the new synodic cycle of Mars to Pluto, meaning it began that cycle for all of us because it happened in the sky, it just happened to take place in his fifth house. Now, the Mars-Pluto synodic cycle, which is the time that it takes for the faster-moving planet to conjoin with the slower-moving planet and then move on and make its way around the, the zodiac till it conjoins that slower-moving planet again, that time for Mars is 692 days or 1.89 years. That's how long it takes for Mars to complete its revolution around the sun, and that's including with any retrogrades in between. So 
That cycle started, as I said, April 26, 2018. And on June 20th, 2019, the date of Trump's first defamatory tweet against Carol, Mars was at the halfway point of that cycle. Mars was in Cancer, opposing Pluto at 22 Capricorn. So, whoa, we can now note that transiting Mars at that time was conjoining Trump's natal 23-degree, 48-minute Saturn and waxing into a conjunction or towards a conjunction with his 25-degree, 45-minute natal Venus in his 11th house when his defamation of Carol, which led to the two trials that have both concluded and found him negligent, guilty, whatever you want to call it, um, began in earnest. It found him accused, uh, uh, guilty of sexual assault, the first one, second one of defamation. Um, so it's just interesting to look at this cycle because uh, you'll find out why in a minute. But the next Mars-Pluto cycle began on March 23rd, 2020. That one was at 24 degrees and 23 minutes of Capricorn. Pluto was still at that time in Trump's fifth house, um, opposing, this was more directly opposing, it was in between his natal Saturn at 23 degrees, 48 minutes of Cancer, and his natal Venus at 25 degrees and 45 minutes of Cancer in his 11th house. As I said, this is a 5th house to 11th house uh, conjunction of Mars to Pluto. Um, and the 11th house, which I've mentioned before in mundane astrology, represents legislature. So that Saturn's last transit opposite Trump's natal Saturn and Venus, you know, conjunction there, took place between March 1990 and February 1991, which is when Saturn's transit off and on exact opposed his natal Saturn and his natal Venus. And during that time, it became clear that this transit was reflected in financial loss. And that financial loss was illustrated by what happened during that period because it was during that period, again, when transiting Saturn and Capricorn opposed his natal Saturn and Venus in Cancer exact several times, that he began to lose money on his Atlantic City, City New Jersey casinos, which had opened in circa 1984. In fact, Donald Trump reported losing $916 million on his state tax returns in 1995, and his casinos, casinos were shuttered on November 22, 2004, when, as NBC reported at the time, and I quote, Donald J. Trump's casino empire has filed for bankruptcy protection after months of negotiations with bondholders over restructuring a crushing debt, end quote. On that November 22, 2004 date, transiting Pluto was conjunct Trump's fourth house Sagittarius South Node which is where we often expel things, right? That's usually not a uh, conjunction. So the south node is when we have to let go. And, you know, a lot of times there's less than fortuitous things happening. And transiting Pluto conjo conjoined his natal Sag south node, which is within a degree to his natal Sag moon, and at the same time opposed his natal 10th house Gemini north node and his natal sun. And again, at that time, NBC reported, quote, Trump Hotels and Casino Resorts, Inc. and numerous related operations filed for protection from its creditors under Chapter 11 of the Bankruptcy Code on Sunday in U.S. Bankruptcy Court in Camden, New Jersey. The Trump Casino business consists mainly of three Atlantic City properties and a riverboat casino in Indiana, end quote. This occurred just before Trump's new show, The Apprentice, began to air on January 8, 2004. Now, we know because when you have to, you know, if you're delineating an individual's chart, 
you have to look at their life, right? And thus far, what's what's happened in their life. And Trump managed to escape the worst effects of bankruptcy, A, by writing some of it off on his taxes. He's the one who says, I don't pay any taxes because I had so much uh, debt that, you know, I didn't owe anything for so long. And we know that he has a particularly lucky chart. Um, you know, his, his moon and south node, trine is ascendant, his sun and his north node, sextile is ascendant, and also his Mars there. So, and they're both in Leo, which is not, you know, in certain circumstances, not known as an unlucky, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, archetypal energy. Um, but the question now is whether or not, after all this time, his luck is finally running out. So, just to continue with the Mars-Pluto theme, it was June 5th of 2021 when Mars and Cancer again opposed Pluto at 26 degrees of Capricorn in Trump's fifth house. And oh, look at this. The January 6th House Rep of Representatives Committee investigating the events of January 6th in 2021, which was, of course, the day of the riot at the Capitol and the insurrection there, was formed on July 1st, 2021. So Mars opposed his Pluto again in the cycle that began in, um, as I said, uh, 2020. Uh, it opposed it again on June 5th, 2021. And a month later, or less than a month later, that committee was formed, which led to, you know, uh, um, so much since then, including his impeachment. So, I mean, really, like, you can't make this stuff up, right? And the next conjunction of the Mars-Pluto cycle occurred at 27 degrees and 50 minutes of Capricorn, still in Trump's fifth house. And did I mention that fifth house is the house of children? So that Synodic cycle began on March 3rd of 2022, and at that time, Venus joined Mars and Pluto as part of that conjunction when she was at 27 degrees and 31 minutes of Capricorn. So the two big events that I can find that manifested during this part of the waxing cycle was the death of Trump's first wife um, at the age of 73, Ivana Trunk, Trump, sorry, <laughs> after a fall down the stairs in her home on July 15th, 2022, and the appointment on November 18th of 2022 by United States Attorney General Merrick Garland of Jack Smith as special counsel to oversee the criminal investigations into Donald Trump's actions regarding the January 6th U.S. attack on the Capitol and Trump's handling and storage of government records, including classified documents, at his Mar-a-Lago estate. Now, the latter event occurred as Mars was retrograding over Trump's natal Gemini sun. It was, Leah, it was uh, well, Gemini, and quincunxing, transiting Pluto again in his fifth house. So if we fast forward to the next Mars-Pluto conjunction, we come to February 13th, and that's the February 13th that's now less than two weeks away. So this is when the two will come together to begin, uh, again, to begin a new cycle at zero degrees and 46 minutes of Aquarius, just after Mars enters Aquarius on February 11th Eastern Time. So, I'm sorry, February, oh no, it is the 13th. So, um, yeah, Mars enters Aquarius Pacific time late on the 12th of February, but um, enters Aquarius early, early morning at 1.05 1 a.m. Eastern time on February 13th. And later that day, he will, uh, Mars conjoins Pluto on the west coast at 10.06 p.m., but actually um, on February 14th on the east coast at 1.06 a.m. So, um, now let's remember that between right now and that date, uh, and it's going to be any day now, I think, 
it's expected that we'll have a decision from Judge Engoron in the New York Attorney General's civil suit against Trump and his two sons. Remember, Trump's Saturn-Venus conjunction is in Cancer, representing his commitment to family. I mean, presumably, although I think any of us who follow Trump over the past couple of years kind of know he favors his family. There's no doubt about it. He went into business with them or kept them as part of his business, but that if push comes to shove, he may well throw them under the bus. That remains to be seen. There's also, well, anyway, um, there's also speculation that because Ivanka Trump did not um, have to stand trial with her father and brothers in the New York civil suit, that because Trump would be banned from life from doing business in New York State, but his two sons would be banned for only five years, Ivanka would not be banned. And so there's the possibility that Donald Trump would turn over all his holdings to her in order to keep the business functioning in New York. That's speculation and nobody knows yet. But that that uh, uh, verdict from Judge Angoran could be up to $347 million, because that's what Letitia James, the New York Attorney General, is asking for um, as, you know, to repayment for what Trump and the family have stolen in taxes and overvaluations of real estate, etc., because, of course, those taxes go to the state. So it's important to notice that transiting Pluto's right now just a little under a degree away from his sixth house cusp. And that means that because, you know, um, Pluto entered Aquarius again, or re-entered Aquarius, he's still going to retrograde, as I've mentioned in the past, from early September through November 19th. And when he does, he'll be rocking and rolling over that sixth house cusp back into Trump's fifth house until he fully enters his sixth house at one degree, 42 minutes of Aquarius. So, uh, you know, it doesn't pull us too far away. I mean, you know, it's leaving the fifth house of children and entering his sixth house of health, daily routine and service. You know, Trump, who likes to solicit funds from his supporters to pay for his legal fees, which the other day there was an article saying he'd taken $55 million and spent it on his legal fees, which of course doesn't count the lawyers that he doesn't pay, um, that, you know, this, this could somehow transfer. I mean, I, my money would be 77 years old and, and showing cognitive decline, as I agree with Nikki Haley about <laughs> and have agreed since I saw his, his transiting the Neptune square his Uranus and... Uh, his his sun, moon, and nodal structure probably two and a half years ago now. Um, this was not much in dispute in my mind. But, you know, as that uh, as the transiting Pluto moves away from his fifth house, will his concern be less about his children and more about his future? The sixth house is also known as a workhouse, you know, so uh, as in terms of how you earn a, a workhouse in terms of what you do as part of your daily routine. And it's funny because I mentioned the fact that while he was working his way towards bankruptcy in the 90s, uh, I mean, in the, in the early 2000s, obviously he was setting himself up to make a deal. Uh, I don't remember what channel it was, right, on television, but to become the star of the new reality show called The Apprentice. So whether he's got something else up his sleeve or not, aside from trying to become president, but, you know, that's an, a full-time occupation right now, I don't know. Anyway, I just thought all of that was interesting. So what's even more interesting is that this new synodic cycle that's beginning between February 13th and 14th, in his chart, is going to come to an opposition um, on November 3rd, which is two days before the November 5th presidential election. 
Now, a lot of astrologers, I don't remember if I mentioned this before or not, but a lot of astrologers are, are predicting some kind of crisis or some kind of violent incident that may happen leading up to and or during the uh, election of, you know, of those couple of days. Um, I have chosen, which I mentioned in my recent lecture about the U.S. Sibley Chiron return, women's rights, and the 2024 presidential election, that frictional aspects between Mars and Pluto met, represent rape. So if we think about all that I've said in terms of Trump and finances, right, because Pluto obviously is other people's money and joint resources, and Mars is, is you know, um, battle and war and, uh, you know, winning and all that kind of stuff. Um, there is a, a metaphorical or more symbolic res resonance to raping financially, right? But I believe if we want to extend that metaphor and its symbolism that's starting in June of 2022, oh, and that's one thing I forgot here. Okay, so um, with that synodic cycle, that portion of the synodic cycle, right, during which um, um, it was before it was uh, Ivanka Trump, I'm sorry, Ivana Trump died on July 15, 2022, and it was June 20th of 2022 when the Supreme Court Dobbs decision came down. So forgive me for using this word, but I want to make an impression raping women of their full rights to equality under the law and full rights to bodily autonomy is, I think, an apt description. Um, and Trump's role in that by, of course, having appointed the three Supreme Court justices that tilted the court to a six to three um, dominance in that case and other cases, both previous and future, because now we're looking shortly at, I mentioned this last week too, I believe it was February 8th. No, February 8th is when the Colorado ballot decision will be taken up by the Supreme Court. But there was also the Mifeprestone issue, and that is the abortion drug or abortifacient, is that how they say it, you know, to aid in an abortion. And whether or not the Supreme Court is going to outlaw that uh, as part also of the Comstock Act, Act, which was passed way back when in the 1800s, that says you cannot mail any material that would assist someone in something like an abortion. I mean, there's other, it applies to other things too. You can't mail poisons and things like that. So there is a whole you know, kind of mm, what the Supreme Court will probably refer to as precedent, <laughs> you know. Um, but um, it dates back probably, you know, mm, I think the Comstock Act, I had it down because I used it in my lecture. It was the 1860s, I think, or maybe 1872, because that was somewhere around that one of the Chiron returns. Anyway, it's all very interesting, and it'll be interesting to watch this cycle because, you know, where it falls in the U.S. Sibley chart at the election is the eighth house to the second house. Eighth house, of course, is resources, joint resources, other people's money, death and rebirth. And the second house is finances as they relate and material things as they relate to one's sense of self-esteem and self-value. So on November 3rd of 2024, two days before the U.S. presidential election, transiting Mars will be at 2945 Cancer in Trump's 11th house. It will have already conjoined his natal 2348 Saturn and 2544 Venus, but will be directly opposite transiting Pluto, still in his fifth, but just barely at 29 degrees and 45 minutes of Capricorn. So, um, you know, again, this is an interesting indication because those cycles thus far have not seemed to benefit him 
very much, right? So we wait and we wonder and we pray and we vote. And that's how we deal with the situation. So let's get back to now, uh, because now today as we wax toward tonight's February 2nd, 3rd quarter lunar square, which is a fixed one of the Scorpio moon, which again is ruled by Pluto and its joint resources, other people's money, death and rebirth cycles, square to the sun in Aquarius, which favors groups. The house passed a $78 billion Tax Relief for American Families Workers Act legislation by a 357 to 70 margin. This bipartisan effort to reduce taxes for many average U.S. citizens through the extension of the child tax credit, among other things, um, is an, actually quite an excellent show of, part of bipartisanship, right? At a time when we know that hasn't, you know, the, the, the last year's Congress was criticized for getting very little done, and thus far this year they haven't done much either. Uh, you know, can't even deal with the passing the 2024 budget six freaking months after it was supposed to be passed originally, back in September um, or the beginning of the fiscal year, you know. Uh, but this bill's pathway through the Senate is uncertain. So even though it provides urgent tax relief for working families and small businesses, in the Senate, the Senate Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer is working to figure out a path forward, as uh, Mike, I can imagine his name must be pronounced Crapo, but it's spelled C-R-A-P-O, who's the ranking member on the tax committee. He's the minority um, member on the GOP side. He wants to see some changes to that legislation. So the Senate GOP also doesn't want to pass this legislation because they don't want it to make Biden, quote unquote, look good while he's up for reelection. So we will wait to see if the Senate will push through this third quarter challenge as we move toward next week's February 9th Aquarius new moon which theoretically at least will ask us to plant seeds of the united we stand divided we fall e pluribus unum philosophy inherent in the creation of this nation. So as we transit through this third quarter square and as the lunar monthly cycle wanes during this coming next week, I wanted to note also several other developments related to groups and funding, meaning money, of course. One is that yesterday, on February 1st, it was announced in the New York Times that, and I quote, top European leaders coordinated to get Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban to agree to the 50 billion euro plan aimed at keeping Ukraine's economy afloat during the war with Russia. In an article headlined, How a Game of Good Cop, Bad Cop Sealed the EU-Ukraine Fund Deal, the Times wrote, and here I quote, Some European leaders jested they'd send Prime Minister Viktor Orban of Hungary their hotel bills for the extra nights they had to spend in Brussels to convince him to support funding for Ukraine. Others, less jokingly, relayed to him he was facing the risk of a legal suspension from EU proceedings, and a few offered a friendly, sympathetic ear over late-night drinks as he complained about what he sees as a European bureaucracy stacked against him out of ideological animus. Remember, Turkey is, Erdogan is the head of Turkey, Turkey is a NATO member. And the article goes on, by Thursday morning, just one hour into an emergency European Union summit meeting, this carefully coordinated, behind-the-scenes pressure had forced Mr. Orban to fold and agree to a landmark 50 billion euro, which is the equivalent of 54 billion U.S. dollars, fund for Ukraine that will help the country stay afloat for the next four years, even as U.S. aid is stuck in Congress. And the article goes on, playing different roles, these European leaders were central to the effort that finally got Orban on board in a breakthrough not just for Ukraine, but for EU unity as well, end quote. Remember, we're talking about the uh, realignment of the global order here. This is part of that. So note, as we approach today's third quarter lunar square of the Scorpio moon, money for the people, 
to the group in humanitarian-oriented Aquarius Sun, the use, note the use in this article of the word ideological. <laughs> and in another development yesterday, also according to the New York Times, and I quote, President Biden on Thursday ordered broad financial and travel sanctions on Israeli settlers accused of violent attacks on Palestinians in the West Bank, a gesture aimed in part at Arab American voters in the United States who have expressed fury about the president's backing of Israel's war in Gaza, end quote. This is part of the U.S.'s fear that a surge in settler attacks in the West Bank against Palestinians could set off wider violence, and the article continues, and I quote, Mr. Biden authorized the sanctions with an executive order that goes further than a directive issued in December by the State Department, which imposed visa bans on dozens of Israeli settlers who have committed acts of violence in the West Bank. The new order cuts people off from the U.S. financial system, Pluto, Scorpio, anyone, and from assets or property they have in the United States. It also prevents them from traveling to the United States. Four people would be sanctioned on Thursday, but there will be more announcements to come, according to Biden administration officials who spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss details of the order. The executive order comes as Mr. Biden faces growing criticism over U.S. support for Israel's war in Gaza, which I already said, including from his own party. And American officials fear a recent surge in attacks by Israeli settlers against Palestinians in the West Bank could set off even wider violence, making an already combustible situation worse. Quote, this violence poses a grave threat to peace, security, and stability in the West Bank, Israel, and the Middle East region and threatens the national security and foreign policy interests of the United States, said Jake Sullivan, the president's national security advisor. Palestinians and many analysts say that Israel's government has allowed the often heavily armed settlers to operate with impunity. And the office of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel responded to the sanctions by saying the, quote, vast majority, unquote, of Israeli West Bank settlers are, quote, law-abiding citizens and that Israel, quote, acts against lawbreakers everywhere, so there's no need for exceptional steps in this matter. And he said that in a statement. But the White House announced the sanctions just hours before Mr. Biden was set to hold a campaign event in Michigan, a critical battleground state that has a large Arab-American population has, and has been the site of numerous protests over the war in Gaza. And before leaving for Michigan, Mr. Biden spoke out about what he said was the trauma the death and destruction in Israel and Gaza. Speaking for, at a national prayer breakfast in Washington, he pledged to work for the release of hostages and the lives of Palestinians. Michigan is critical to Mr. Biden's campaign for a second term. In 2020, he won the state over former President Donald J. Trump by 154,188 votes out of almost 5.5 million votes cast that year. Michigan is home to several hundred thousand Arab Americans, most of whom live in the Detroit area. Those areas voted again by big margins for Mr. Biden in 2020. So this is doubtless one of the levers Biden is availing himself of as part of, you know, um, uh, the Leo full moons. We started with the, the Capricorn new moon, the Leo full moon, right, of leaders applying a more steady hand as per the message of the January 11th cap new moon. And I had already mentioned last week that President Biden had sent his U.S. His US CIA director, William Burns, to the Middle East to help broker a hostage for prisoners deal along with an up to six weeks six fire with Israel and Hamas in Gaza. And so far, so good as the prospects for such a deal have not yet fallen completely through and negotiations reportedly continue. So now, late on February 4th and early on February 5th, Mercury joins the Sun and Pluto when it enters the sign of Aquarius. So these two together may well expedite communication or actual movement through these kinds of groups, right, with different ideologies, given the theme of the monthly lunar cycle. However, on February 9th at 2.59 p.m. Pacific, and 5.59 p.m. Eastern Time, as both luminaries conjoin at 20 degrees and 41 minutes of Aquarius, 
which will follow the February 8th exact sun square to Uranus, we may see some sudden changes. Though given that the nature of Uranian Aquarian energy is always unpredictable, it's hard to say exactly which way this energy will swing. It's a common cliche in the astrological world that if we expect something to happen during a Uranian transit, it won't happen. And that's because Uranus is always an expect the unexpected energy, which usually means, as we say in New York, forget about it in terms of making a prediction. But sometimes some of us who are highly intuitive do manage to get it right. But it's just not, you know, it might be partially right with yet another little bit of surprise. You know, so as I mentioned last week and I mentioned earlier, February 8th is the day that the Supreme Court will hear the arguments in the Colorado case to decide whether or not Trump can remain on the state's presidential ballot there. And it's speculated is that um, the um, Supreme Court will probably buck throwing him off one state's ballot because that would create such an imbalance with the other states. It's probably, again, an e pluribus unum type deal where it's, you know, he's on in every state or he's off in every state. And it's highly unlikely the the legal experts believe that he will, that the court will mandate throwing Trump off of the ballot, you know, in general. So um, the... You know, and it's interesting to note, like I said before, then on February 13th and 14th, we got the new synodic cycle of Mars and Pluto happening. But also leading up, you know, um, to this third quarter square, we've seen a lot of news this week about the Internet and social media platforms. So yesterday, the House held hearings um, leading to the question, will lawmakers really act to protect children online? And as I'm running out of time, I don't have time really to go into detail about that, but that's easy to research in the news. My point is that, um, well, I'll read you some of this. It said, uh, lawmakers have long made statements about holding tech companies to account and have little to show for it. Republicans and Democrats alike have at various points declared that it was time to regulate the tech giants over matters such as privacy and antitrust. This is from the New York Times yesterday. Um, Yet for years, that was where it ended, with no new federal regulations for the companies to follow. The question is whether this time will be different. And already there are indicators that the topic of online child safety may gain more traction legislatively. Let's just pray that that's followed by gun legislation, right? Okay, that's an aside. Go back to the Times. At least six legislative proposals awaiting in the wings in Congress target the spread of child sexual abuse material online and would require platforms such as Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok to do more to protect minors. The efforts are backed by emotional accounts of children who were victimized online and died by suicide. And meanwhile, also yesterday on February 1st, here's the headline, another headline. I'm sorry, it's times heavy, but Universal Music Group pulls songs from TikTok. The music giant, home to stars like Taylor Swift and Drake, and I I, I don't have time to get into the Taylor Swift conspiracy theories, but I'm sure you all know how I feel about that. I'm sure I'll make it clear if you don't in future episodes. But anyway, the music giant had threatened to withdraw licenses for its tracks to the social media juggernaut if they failed to come to a new agreement. Videos on TikTok began to go silent early Thursday, that's yesterday morning, after combative licensing negotiations broke down this week between the popular social media platform and Universal Music Group, the giant company that releases music by artists such as we mentioned, Sailor Twift, Drake, U2, Ariana Grande, etc. So this week on Tuesday, a day before its licensing contract with TikTok was set to expire, Universal, the largest of the three major record companies, published a fiery open letter accusing TikTok of offering unsatisfactory payment for music and of allowing its platform to be, quote, flooded with AI-generated recordings that diluted the pool, the royalty pool for real human Uh, musicians. Um, So TikTok confirmed yesterday that it removed these videos 
and um, there are some that are gone, there are some that are still there, so nobody knows in the future how much more is going to disappear, if they'll come to, you know, um, uh, some kind of agreement or whatever. I'm currently watching the series Suits on Netflix, so first I watch How to Commit Murder, and between the two of them, I'm like, um, it seems like you have to be a real, um, what, what, I don't know how to put it. It's like some of these people are cer certifiably psychopathic and some of them are just like, so, you know, they're cunningly smart in ways that they figure out how to get around the law, but it's the law that they're supposed to be there to defend and protect. So anyway, who knows what kind of settlement may, may arise, you know, in, in the future. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to say that Mercury squares Jupiter on February 10th. This is after next week, so I'll talk about this next week too. And again, I already mentioned Mars enters Aquarius on February 12th and 13th, and then we have the conjunction. But Mars square Jupiter and then conjoining Pluto between February 10th and the 13th. Um, I, I saw this in the, in the um, Boston Globe from January 31st. And I've mentioned before, Jupiter, of course, is one of its archetypal meanings is higher education. So I saw this headline as Fury with Harvard Grows, because that's one of the institutions where they fired the president after those congressional hearings about anti-Semitism on campus. The, the headline says, as Fury with Harvard Grows, aggrieved students and alums look for new ways to change university's course. And this again, too, you know, given the fact that this is um, also near this Mars-Pluto next conjunction, it, the article says, Harvard University faced new challenges Tuesday from pro-Palestinian and Muslim students alleging the school has not protected them from harassment and racism and from alumni pressuring school leadership to focus on free speech and broadening the school's conception of diversity. Meanwhile, Kenneth Griffin, a mega donor who gave Harvard so much money that it named its largest graduate school after him last year, said at a conference Tuesday that elite universities now produce, quote, whiny snowflakes instead of, quote, leaders and problem solvers because of their excessive focus on, quote, microaggressions and DEI agenda, which is the diversity agenda. So anyway, I wanted to mention that before I signed off because um, it just seemed, you know, this is something, the free speech issue and all of this stuff is just coming to a head. I want to spend a podcast in the future talking about Pluto in Aquarius. I'm sorry that I, I haven't done so, but a lot of these different things are showing us, you know, the, the steps forward uh, as sort of a, a preview of what is going to, you know, uh, take place, what has slowly been taking place and what will continue to take place as we move into the age of Aquarius more deeply and the, um, you know, the transit of Pluto through Aquarius for the next 20 years. So thank you everyone for joining me today. I hope you have enjoyed this episode of Karmic Evolutions, Astrologically Speaking. And I do hope that you will join me next week on February 9th when we'll talk about all the things that, especially that, that you know, um, Aquarius new moon, which squares Uranus. So between now and then, I hope that you have enjoyed this and I will see you next week. Namaste. Long ago, before this day's confusion did begin. Throughout the stars did we go wandering Distance was no barrier And time it had no hope Free to come And free to go Free to come Open up the book.